Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, if I could ask everyone now to take their seats, we can begin the activities for the evening. And, and my name is Andrew Hamilton. I am the Vice Chancellor of Oxford University. And it's an enormous pleasure for me to welcome all of you to this evening to the celebration of Oxford University and the celebration of some of the great science that goes on in Oxford. And we'll be hearing from one of Oxford's most distinguished scientists, Russell Foster, in a few moments. But let me say just how delighted I am to be back in Hong Kong. Uh, my wife, Jenny, who's on the front row, and I arrived two hours ago and, and I have to say that every time I come to Hong Kong particularly after a very long plane ride and a very long queue to get through immigration uh, it you arrive in the city and immediately you are energized and I think this uh, is a magnificent place to come and recharge batteries and just get a sense of dynamism that is very much part of, of this uh, great city. And whenever I come to Hong Kong, I always feel buoyed up. I always feel encouraged. And I arrived here at the uh, Hong Kong Football Club and I, and I walked through the front door. There, were, there was a crowd and there were journalists. And I thought, isn't that wonderful? Hong Kong <laughs> laying out the red carpet for the Oxford Vice Chancellor. And then this, this gentleman, uh, who's uh, I think seven feet, six inches tall, Yao Ming, followed me in. And, and I suddenly realized that the reception committee was not for me. However, all of you are here for the same reason that I am here, which is your love of Oxford University and the many things that Oxford University has brought to you in your lives and your careers. And, and it's just wonderful. Whoa. It's wonderful to see. It's wonderful to see such a large group of alumni here. Again, as I said, celebrating Oxford University. And, and you know, to come here uh, and also get a feel for, I, I was saying to uh, a couple of you earlier as, as we chatted, to get a, a, just to feel warm weather again. Let me say, uh, I know this may be hot for you, but for us in England, we have had the most miserable several weeks of weather. We've had the wettest April in the history of the United Kingdom. More rain has come from the sky. It's been cold. But of course, what does that do in Oxford? It waters the grass. It waters the flowers. And let me tell you, now in May, Oxford is looking magnificent. Just as all of you will remember it, the students are beginning to now get stuck into their final exams. And there's a real sense of that special time of year, springtime, in Oxford and it's, uh, it's, uh, it looks magnificent. It's wonderful to be here and to see, as I said, such a, a collection and such a large number of alumni. And one really gets a sense from your presence here of how important the university is in Hong Kong. It's important for you. It is also very important for us to strengthen and enhance the links between Oxford University and Hong Kong. And I'm delighted that here to this evening we have present a number of people playing these very important roles. I want to first of all single out Jeremy Woodall. And Jeremy, if he'd just raise his hand, of course you know Jeremy is the Director of Development for Asia, but of course is also the head of the Oxford China office based here in Hong Kong. Hong Kong is so important for us that we've decided we must have a permanent presence of the university on the ground. But of course, that goes into many different areas of university activity. We have also just recently established a part of the technology transfer arm of Oxford University called ISIS. 
and we now have ISIS Enterprise Asia, an office here in Hong Kong, and David Baghurst, the head of ISIS Development. Where's David? There's David, that, and, and uh, he is bringing the experience of Oxford's technology transfer, bringing Oxford scientific and medical developments here to Hong Kong. What other aspects of Oxford do we have very strong, very firmly on the ground here? Of course, Oxford University Press. And I was delighted last year to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Oxford University Press in China and here in Hong Kong. And I'm delighted that Ben Mack, where's Ben? The Deputy Regional Director right at the back there. Ben, ben has, has uh, already ensured that Oxford University Press will have a significant part of my time in Hong Kong because tomorrow afternoon, I will be reading a story to about 26 year olds, one of Oxford University Press's reading stories and uh, I suspect they will be every bit as challenging as Oxford undergraduates, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Let me also highlight another very important part of our activities in Hong Kong, that is of course student recruitment. And I'm delighted to recognize Sophie Hurden. Where's Sophie? Is Sophie here? There she is, right at the back. Sophie Hurden, and Sophie is the student recruitment officer for undergraduate admissions, doing something that you all know is very important, which is encouraging the best and the brightest of Hong Kong and mainland China students to think about Oxford University for their studies that great opportunity for an educational experience that is superior to any other in the world. And of course, we see the consequences of that superior education in all of you, in our alumni. A university is only as strong as its alumni. You are the representation of what we do in our research and in our teaching. It is you passing through Oxford, being educated in Oxford, and then going on to do great things in your lives. You represent and act as ambassadors for the university. And of course it is, as ambassadors, you support us. It, you support us in events like tonight, you support us financially, you support us with the commitment of your time, and we are enormously grateful for that. There are more than 1,600 Oxford alumni here in Hong Kong, and you form the backbone for our connection to this part of the world. And of course, that, that connection has been so long standing in this great city. It's been a connection that has helped us in so many ways, but perhaps the most important of those ways is the support for the university that is absolutely essential in these challenging economic times in the 21st century. The support in financial terms, in phila philanthropic terms, is enormously important and much, much appreciated. You will know that Oxford has been involved in a fundraising campaign for the last four years. In 2008, we set ourselves an incredibly challenging goal, the goal of a billion and a quarter pounds, and we thought we might never reach it. Well, let me tell you, about six months ago, all of you will have seen, we had the great pleasure of announcing that far ahead of time, we had reached that one and a quarter billion pounds mark. And in fact, we are now going through a process of thinking what should we do next and it won't surprise you what we are going to do next is increase the goal because support the support in the United <coughs> Kingdom for Oxford University as you will all know is diminishing and so if we want to ensure that this great university stays at the absolute pinnacle of higher education worldwide we must ensure that we have the financial support in so many different areas of our activities. We will hear tonight a wonderful example of Oxford's medical research. 
in Russell Foster's talk on sleep. We, you all know, the enormous contributions and the enormous role that the study of China plays in Oxford's activities. I am delighted that next year we will be breaking ground on a new physical heart for the study of China in Oxford. The Oxford China Centre, it will be housed on St Hugh's College, but it will be for all of Oxford and it will become a magnet for scholars and students from around the world to come and study and to learn about China in one of the great centres of scholarship in the world, Oxford University. And of course, why is Oxford such a magnet and such a special place? Yes, the scholars, yes, the quality of students, but also the magnificent collections that we have in the Bodleian Library, that we have in the Ashmolean Museum, that we have in the Pitt Rivers Museum. Collections that truly represent China and all of its cultural and artistic facets. Let me, in, in, I mentioned alumni, I mentioned the importance of alumni to Oxford. Well, let me single out a critical part of our alumni structure. And in Hong Kong, that is represented by the Oxbridge Society of Hong Kong, the Oxford and Cambridge Society, as an Oxford Vice-Chancellor who was educated at Cambridge. It's particularly, it's a particular pleasure for me to welcome Jonathan Hoy. And Jonathan is the newly elected president of the Oxbridge Hong Kong Society. He's a Brasenose alumnus. And in after today's lecture, he will be handling the question and answer. I've had, I've had the great privilege of, of being part of the Hong Kong Oxbridge Society. I was here one year ago, and where's Michael Ung? Michael Ung was here, he was uh, a Cambridge alumnus, but we've allowed him through the door. And, 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 and Michael was, was the, the, the previous president and invited me to the boat race dinner here in Hong Kong last year. This year, you all know what happened in the boat race. This year, I had the privilege of attending another boat race dinner, not in Hong Kong. I was in New York about a month ago and attended the boat race dinner there. For me to be one year in Hong Kong, one year in New York, who knows where I will be next year for the boat race dinner, but I will be somewhere and it reinforces to us what a worldwide presence Oxford University and, yes, Cambridge University have throughout the world. And if I may just say one word about what happened in this year's boat race, all of you know what an incredibly unfortunate and, and disappointing day it was for both Oxford and Cambridge. It was, I feel, and I'll, I'll say it in all seriousness, that, that, that demonstrator, that head in the water, it was an assault on achievement. It was an assault on excellence. Those 17 young men and one woman, because the Oxford Cox was a woman, they had trained and dedicated themselves for months in the way that all of you and all the scholars and students in Oxford dedicate themselves to their work, their academic work. Those young, those young rowers had dedicated themselves to the, the pinnacle of achievement. And so for me, that event, that demonstrator, was assaulting the very heart of what Oxford University represents. That is excellence in all of its guises. And so if I can, before introducing Russell, just finish on what for me is a very, very, very serious note. And I think it's something all of you will join with me. That is to ensure that in this modern day, when there are assaults from lone demonstrators and sometimes from politicians as well, against excellence, against the benefit and the importance of achievement and commitment, that we rebuff it, that we repel it, and that we go on as those Oxford rowers did, 
even with only seven oars, they still kept going as if they had a chance. And so for me, they were very symbolic of what is important about Oxford University and, and what we do. And this evening, we have a wonderful other example of that. And it's an enormous pleasure for me to introduce Professor, Professor Russell Foster. His presentation tonight is part of the lecture series that we've called the Oxford Academics in China, bringing leading academics to you to hit, so that you can hear about the great cutting edge work that is going on. We've had talks in the past here in Hong Kong in, on, on politics from Nairi Wood, on the on, uh, nuclear renaissance from Roger Cashmore, even on Rasputin from Michael Nicholson, as some of you will know. It gives you a, a, an, an example of the breadth of scholarship that goes on in Oxford. And tonight we will hear from Professor Russell Foster He's the chair of the Circadian Neuroscience and head of the Nuffield Laboratory of Ophthalmology at Oxford, the uh, Centre for Sleep and Circadian Neuroscience that Russell heads, has just received one of the most prestigious grants and financial awards from the Wellcome Trust literally two weeks ago, I think it was, Russell. So he's still feeling very happy and buoyed by that event. He represents the very best that <coughs> Oxford has to offer. He will be talking today about sleep. His title is Pillow Talk, The Biology of Sleep. I'm delighted that after the event, he will also be signing his new book, which is a Sleep, A Very Short Introduction. <coughs> published by, of course, Oxford University Press. And Russell, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to the stage. Russell. Well, thank you very much indeed, Vice Chancellor. It's a really great honor um, and privilege for me to be here to represent really a very thin slice of, of, a, of a huge amount of biomedical research that's going on in Oxford uh, at the moment. And I hope I can only do justice to that glorious introduction. Um, first of all, I thought I'd start with a reminder of perhaps some of the great views in Oxford and, and to encourage you to, to visit again. This is standing at the back of Old Quad, uh, looking through the Porter's Lodge to the camera in the background. Um, and I have to say, those of us who are members of Brasenose College um, get deep satisfaction with that view. <clears throat> so what I thought we'd do in the next hour or so is talk about the the neuroscience and the neurobiology of sleep, and give you an update of some of the new developments that have been going on in Oxford. I've structured the talk along the following lines. There'll be a sort of a brief introduction, the importance of time, uh, and then talk about the brain and the body clock, this internal representation of the day ticking away, producing a, a 24-hour oscillation that is regulating very many aspects of our physiology and behavior. But there's a lot more to sleep than the body clock, as you'll see in the next section, which is how sleep is generated. And our understanding of the neuroscience of sleep has increased enormously. And one of the key bits of understanding has been what happens when sleep and circadian rhythms are disrupted. And then finally talk about a very new area which relates to that, that Wellcome Trust Strategic Award that, that our Vice Chancellor just talked about, the relationship between sleep disruption and mental illness. A new synthesis, perhaps a really new and exciting way of going forward in dealing with one of the genuinely crippling conditions uh, that humanity suffers. And then touch right at the end upon our new institute and give you some flavour of what we're trying to build in Oxford. And then, of course, the questions. Okay. Ah, yes. Just to remind you, um, uh, this may look, yes, actually it probably is, may look a bit like shameless advertising. Um, and of course it is. Um, but what you have to understand is the complete terror of an author. Because what happens is you, you go into a bookshop and you see great mounds of your book. There it is. And then you get close and, and you sort of smile and then the smile is wiped off your face as you see they've all been reduced to 50 cents. Um, <laughs> The serious note is that actually much of what I'll discuss will be, be contained within these, of this wonderful um, uh, production by Oxford University, of Press, uh, Oxford University Press. And it was great fun working with him. It was a, I've, I've published three books now, and this was by far the, the, the best fun. Okay, let's kick off with the introduction. 
And these 24-hour body clocks, often called circadian rhythms, rhythms of about a day. And these circadian rhythms and sleep processes have captured the popular imagination extraordinarily. Um, over the past 10 years, you can't really open a magazine or um, some sort of television article or something without becoming aware of body clocks and sleep. Now, I have to say, this is not entirely helpful some of the time. And I thought I'd just, right at the beginning, share you an example of one of the painful experiences. Um, this was an article in the Daily Mirror. Now, uh, some of you may remember the Daily Mirror, um, and I worked jolly hard with this young lady here, Beth Gibbon, um, and I was fairly comfortable with statements like, natural rhythms rule our bodies and dictate the best times for a range of activities, and here's our countdown. I was far less comfortable with, 10 a.m., have a bikini wax. <laughs> or anything, or an injection, or, or a visit to the dentist, basically anything with an ouch factor. Pain intensity is at its lowest between 8 and 10 a.m., says Professor Russell Foster. It's not entirely clear why, but it's probably because pain receptors aren't as alert as they are later in the day. Now, I promise you I never said that. Um, <laughs> and I certainly never said 6.30 p.m. heralds the start of two and a half hours of sex and booze. <laughs> so... If you're feeling a bit frisky in about 25 minutes, um, <laughs> you know what's going on. But of course, what this alludes to is some truly extraordinary biology. Uh, if we look at rhythmic changes in human physiology, uh, as illustrated down here at, in the middle of the day and the middle of the night, we see that physiology is remarkably dynamic. It's constantly being adjusted over the 24-hour day. So, for example, hormones like melatonin, we may want to discuss melatonin when, when we finished, absolutely no release at all uh, during the day. But in anticipation of dark and rest, melatonin levels will rise. And in anticipation of waking and the end of sleep, melatonin levels will collapse. Body, body, core body temperature, in anticipation of activity, core body temperature, metabolic rate is increased. And it peaks, actually, at around about 6 to 8 o'clock in the evening. This, this change in core body temperature, only about a degree, is actually quite important to athletes. And as the Olympics is just coming up, a good example would be that an Olympic swimmer can swim 100 metres 2.7 seconds faster here than they can here during the training session. 2.7 seconds doesn't sound like much, of course, but actually it's the, the difference between coming first and last. Uh, in an Olympic race. So, again, these dynamic changes tuning our ability to function. Alertness and performance. Low point in cognitive performance around about 4 to 6 o'clock in the morning. We'd all appreciate that we're uh, uh, not very alert at that time of the day. But the level of impairment here is quite extraordinary. The level of impairment is comparable to consuming sufficient alcohol to make you le legally drunk. So if you happen to be driving a car at 4 to 6 o'clock in the morning, your ability to drive that car is as bad as if you got in the car drunk. So if you take nothing from this lecture whatsoever, is please don't drive at that time of the day. <laughs> okay, so what we have here is that if you or I were to go to a dim, dark cave, constant light, constant temperature, these rhythms continue. They're endogenous. They're not driven from outside. And we have this biological clock which anticipates the varying demands of activity and rest, and fine-tunes almost every aspect of our physiology and behaviour in advance. Now, because rhythmic physiology is so dynamic, one might predict that lots of consequences, there will be lots of consequences in terms of, of, of time of day effects on health. And this is some data by my colleague Peter Rothwell, whose office is just around the corner from mine in the John Radcliffe. And what Peter has plotted is time of day along this axis and the frequency of stroke. And you see that between 6 a.m. and 12 noon, there's a 49% greater chance of having a stroke than any other time of the day. Now, that's terribly important because what that information can provide us with is some ways of thinking about mitigating some of the uh, uh, stroke-inducing effects by delivering medications in this window here before the strokes actually kick in. Just as an aside, this is a, actually a rather dangerous window between 6 a.m. and 12 noon. And there's in fact a greater, there's a 29% greater chance of dying naturally between 6 a.m. and 12 noon than any other time of the day. So tomorrow, when, when you look at your wristwatch, and it's <laughs> just past 12, you think, phew. I've survived the most dangerous part of the day. 
Timing of drug deliveries in humans is also turning out to be critically important. And I don't have time. In fact, I've, I've been chatting to, to, to school children and, and, and the business community, and I did spend a bit more time on this. But just to give you one early illustration of the impact of time of delivery of drugs. This was in childhood leukemia, and it's an old study by Rivard and colleagues, not, not done in Oxford. We've been able to follow up on some of these remarkable observations. And he showed that if you give this cocktail of anti-cancer drugs, either in the morning or the evening, those children that got the drug in the morning had a two and a half fold greater chance of relapse than those had in the evening. And this is the sort of information whereby circadian biology is genuinely beginning to inform clinical treatments. In the area of cancer, it's critically important. Okay, so that was a brief introduction about the importance of biological time. Let's now think about its origins, how it arises within the central nervous system. And of course, for that, we must look at this the most wonderful organ, of course, in the known universe, which, of course, is the human brain. And, and we flipped it on its back, and here you see the optic nerves going in and fusing in this structure here. Here's the pituitary gland, that extraordinary gland that controls much of our endocrinology. But just, just above the pituitary gland, where the two optic nerves fuse here, is a relatively small structure, paired structure, called the suprachiasmatic nuclei, or the SCN. And this is the bit of the brain that represents the origins of those 24-hour oscillations. And we'll talk a little bit more about the SCN in a moment, but let me put the SCN into a broader context. Here we have the clock, but this clock, which as I said, is, is fine-tuning physiology and behaviour to the varying demands of activity and rest, is no use whatsoever unless it's set to local time. And, and, and the classic mismatch, of course, between biological time and environmental time is jet lag. Our Vice-Chancellor will eventually get over his jet lag as a result of exposure to the light-dark cycle detected by the eyes, which will then set, adjust the clock to local time. And then the clock, in turn, will coordinate rhythmic activity in, in essentially every aspect of our physiology and behaviour. Now, we're going to talk about outputs from the clock quite a bit. And rather than show images like this, you usually represent rhythmic images in the form of an actogram. And what that represents is a series of days, one to about 25 along here. And in this cartoon, we see when the individual is awake and when they're asleep. So this is an actogram. Right. The first point to make is that if this area of the brain is destroyed, then those 24-hour oscillations are lost. In fact, some of my early work was, was, was trying to specifically localise this region of the brain to the genera generation of those 24-hour oscillations. More recently, we've been studying individuals with cancer, with tumours, glioblastomas, for example, in the anterior hypothalamus, and the impact of that tumour uh, 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 spreading through the anterior hypothalamus and generating, tragically, this arrhythmicity. Uh, it, it's, it's, and, and we can talk about some of the impact of, of tumours on this region of the brain perhaps later. Let's talk a bit about that SCN in a bit more detail. There's around about 50,000 neurons either side of the, of the third ventricle here within the SCN. And what's turned out to be truly remarkable is that you can isolate one of those neurons and you can study it in a dish, you can stick an electrode in it, and you'll see that the single neuron will generate 24-hour oscillations. So this clock within is not the product of a network of lots and lots of neurons interacting, but it's actually the product of a subcellular molecular mechanism. And one of the great, I think, achievements in, in fundamental science, neuroscience, over the past 15 to 20 years has been an understanding of how that 24-hour oscillation actually exists. And Again, it's a good example of comparative biology. Back in the early 70s, Seymour Benzer had isolated one of the genes in a fruit fly that was very important in generating its 24-hour oscillations. And then with the advent of the genome projects, where we had actually had sequences of the human and the mouse genome, it became clear that the genes that were linked to the clock in Drosophila were also turning up in humans and mice. And the implications of that are really quite awesome. Just think about it. There's 500, 600 million years of evolutionary divergence between a fly and, and humans, and yet the basic building blocks of the clock 
are conserved across this vast diversity of, of animal life. So next time you squash a fruit fly on your banana, um, just think of some of the, some of the consequences of it. Um, the, basic, the basic mechanism of this molecular clock, again, is, is, is another lecture. But I couldn't help just sort of outlining what's going on. We now know there are around about 12 to 14 clock genes which produce clock proteins. And those proteins then feed back and turn off their own genes. So there's a molecular oscillation here. How does that actually turn into an output? Well, what you get, of course, is in those clock pr proteins is a rhythm of generation and degradation. And it's that rhythmic clock protein signal that is then interpreted by the rest of the body and drives those 24-hour oscillations that we were talking about. It, again, is a remarkable bit of, of neuroscience and biology. And it has an application. Because what's turning out is that changes to some of these clock genes are being linked to particular morning or evening times, whether you like to get up early, go to bed early, go to bed late, get up late. And a classic study has shown that a single amino acid, a single little change in one of those proteins, in one of those clock genes, has been associated with a condition called familial advanced sleep phase syndrome. Those poor individuals have to get up at around about 3 o'clock in the morning, no matter what they've been doing, they get up at 3 o'clock in the morning, work, and then they go to bed at 7.30 in the evening. Their whole clock has been speeded up in time. So again, if you're looking for examples where genes give rise to behaviour, we have a, a really exciting model to study that. Okay, the eye regulating the clock, producing rhythmic outputs. Let's now look at the eye in some detail. The first point to make is that if you have no eyes, then your ability to regulate your clock is gone completely. Now, some of you may remember about 15 years ago, there was a lot of bloody nonsense about shining night light behind the knee. Do you remember this? Shining light behind the knee could shift the body clock. Oh, it's just awful. So glad you've forgotten it because it, <laughs> was, it was because it was deeply frustrating. We were in the early days of trying to understand how the light, uh, the eye, was regulating the clock, and we sent a, a grant off to the Wellcome Trust. Got great reviews, and this wretched paper came out, light behind the knee, in science, um, and the reviews came back saying, oh, "Well, what's Foster looking for? You know, mechanisms whereby the the eye regulates the clock? Well, we know it's light behind the knee, knee, and I didn't get my grant. Um, however." I, I wasn't bitter. Um, um, <laughs> the point is, if you have no eyes, then your ability to align physiology to the light-dark cycle is gone. And in the case of humans, our body clock is a bit longer than 24 hours. And you'll see that what would happen is that we would get up later and later and later and later each day. All right. So how does the eye do this? Now, we're going back to our sort of A-level biology books uh, and a picture of the eye. And this is the retina. And the retina is a multi-layered set of neurons. And here are the photoreceptors, the rods and the cones. And this is the inner part of the retina, the first stage of visual processing by the horizontal, the bipolar, and, and, and the amacrine cells occurs here. They collectively send a signal to the ganglion cells, which then fire off their projections uh, via these axons to the optic nerve. So the optic nerve is made up of a great bundle of fibers from these cells here. Now, we were very curious about how the eye was capable of managing to regulate the clock. Because if you compare the differences in processing sensory information between the visual system and the body clock, they're fundamentally different. So, of course, the visual system captures light from a specific region in, uh, in space. So I look at that candle, it maps very precisely to a, to a part of the retina and then to the visual cortex. The clock doesn't work like that. What it's doing is, is grabbing light from the entire environmental scene. It's sort of a, a general brightness detector. And of course, the ability to do this and this is very, very different. The second is that the clock is really insensitive um, uh, uh, to, to, to dim light. It needs a lot of light to adjust that clock. Whereas, of course, the visual system is ultra-sensitive. So light, which you could comfortably read by, will not shift the clock. The clock needs a lot of exposure to light. It needs minutes. Whereas, of course, the visual system to work has to grab light and then sort of forget it's seen it in a fraction of a second. And then finally, the clock counts light over very long periods of time. You can give the same number of photons over 45 minutes or squeezed into a few minutes, and the clock interprets that as the same signal. Whereas, of course, 
the visual system has this incredibly short millisecond inter integration time. And, and right from the early days, these differences puzzled me profoundly. I couldn't understand how the visual system could actually extract brightness and therefore time of day information from the environment. So our first approach was to use, and this is back in the early 90s, mutant mice, mice in which the rods and cones had largely degenerated. These animals were visually blind. And in fact, many of the models we used were models for human blindness, and we'll touch on that in a moment. And what we did was then take these mice that were visually blind, they had their eyes, of course, but the rods and cones were degenerate, and we popped them into a running wheel. And the great thing, again, about circadian biology is that you have very clear assays. So what you do is you pop the mouse into a running wheel, and under a light-dark cycle, you see the animal, of course, it's nocturnal, runs beautifully at night. If you plunge the animal into complete darkness, of course, the body clock keeps on ticking, but of course, the mouse body clock is slightly shorter than 24 hours, so we see that it starts its activity a little bit earlier and earlier and earlier each day. You can turn the lights on for just 15 minutes, in the middle of the dark phase, and you see that it actually shifts the body clock, and so the animal gets up later the next day. So we have this lovely assay. You can entrain to a light-dark cycle, give a little squirt of light, and you can shift the body clock. So let's look at the data. What's the impact of putting a, a retinally degenerate mouse and exposing it to a light-dark cycle? Here's the data. Here's increasing brightness along here, changing the brightness of the pulse here, and the size of the shift along this axis. Normal animal, one copy of the defective gene, two copies of the defective gene, and to our complete astonishment is that when you overlay the three intensity response curves, this animal that is visually blind has a response in terms of its clock which is statistically indistinguishable from an animal with a perfectly normal set of rods and cones. So, there's a normal circadian response to light. And what we could say from these early experiments is that a mouse can be visually blind, but not circadian blind. We thought we were onto something really fundamental and interesting. And of course, I was young, early 90s, 